and then I get to introduce my better half. Um, Lindsay is a constant reminder that God loves me so much. Um, I don't deserve her, but he is, he's gracious. Amen? All right, let's, let's welcome Pastor Lindsay. Let's give her a hand. Good morning. I love my River family. I love all of you. It's so good to see your faces. I didn't get to be up here today, and normally I get to worship with you and see your worship and see the beauty of the Lord on your faces, but not today, so it's good to get up here and look at you. God is good. Well, this morning I want to share with you something that the Lord laid on my heart a few weeks ago, and it's kind of a, a, a part two or a, a bonus uh, message to the, the last time I spoke on um, the place. We talked about there's something about a physical place when God does something for you in that place. Or when something special happens in that place. And so we, each of us went through and tried to recount and think, what would we name this place, this church, this physical house, if we were to name it for what God has done for us here in this place? Uh, It was a very sweet time, a very special time. Anytime we remember what the Lord has done for us, it's sweet, isn't it? Many times in scripture, he calls us to remember, to reassemble those memories, those thoughts, those happenings and experiences in our minds. And so um, it was a very sweet and special uh, moment that we shared that Sunday morning. But today I want to talk to you about be the place. So there's something special about this place. But each of you carry something special within you that allows you to be the place for this lost world. I want to start in Ephesians 4 this morning. And when I was praying over this and and studying on Friday morning, I was reading the chapter, the whole chapter of Ephesians, which pastor taught from last week. And the Lord just impressed upon me that we, the River Church, and I'm not talking about the global church. I'm not talking about the church in the United States of America. I'm talking about the River Church, us right here. We are in a season of Ephesians 4. We need to heed this word right now for us corporately as a church body. How many of you have ever heard of a guy named John Acuff? Does anybody read his stuff, follow him on Twitter or anything like that? Not many. Well, he's kind of like a motivational speaker, but he's very, very funny. So he's like this cross between of motivational speaker, super funny guy, life coach type thing. And he wrote a book years ago called Stuff Christians Like. And it was a kind of a tongue-in-cheek um, sort of book where he just kind of poked fun at some of the things that we just do in church and nobody like asks questions about like why they happen or why we do them you know the things that we just do um for instance coming into church and you just kind of gravitate to your same seat that you always sat in nobody's ever like said okay this is your seat and put your name on it but we just do it i don't really know why um another thing like Have you ever noticed a lot of times when someone will start praying in the church and we're like having a time of prayer and all of a sudden like magically out of nowhere music starts playing? Why do we do that? Or like the common misnomer that, man, it would be great to work at a church. You would just get to bask in the glory of God all day long and you would get to just worship music just abounds and flows and all these things. And so... He writes of all these several little miniature posts on on things like this, about stuff Christians like. Well, one of the funny things that he wrote about in that book, um, he called it the casserole of hope. How many of you know what a casserole is? (laughs) 
Some are great with casseroles. Some are like, ew, <laughs> gross, like cream of chicken soup, gross. Yeah. Cream of chicken gloop. Um, but he talks about the, uh, the Christian way of taking casseroles to people when they're sick or when they've had something happen in their family. It kind of makes this, this funny thing out of it. So he's talking about, like, obviously, this is an, a great gesture for us to do as believers, right? Is to take a casserole to somebody when they're down and out. I mean, what's more healing than, than um, chicken pot pie, right? Like, some, sometimes you just need a chicken pot pie in your life. But uh, he, he goes on to talk about there are just certain things you shouldn't take to people when certain things have happened to them. So, for instance, if someone's been in a car accident, he says you should avoid taking them anything that can be eaten in a car. Lest they be tempted to eat in the car and have another car wreck. So, for instance, he recommends take them soup with a fork. So it's very hard to eat soup with a fork, let alone do it while you're in the car. He says, with the loss of a pet, don't take people jerky. Bad, bad idea. If someone has suffered the, the loss of their house through a fire, he said, avoid anything char-grilled, blackened, and even all things spicy, because we do not want to remind them of that. He's being funny, but God does call us to a very specific type of ministry and a specific type of way that we love one another. And food is part of that. That's not what I'm speaking on today. But I do want to talk about that feeling of home. That feeling of a home-cooked meal. There's something special about a home-cooked meal, and it's like, it's... There's a reason they call it soul food, right? Because there's a feeling and a sense attached to it. God has called us to be soul food to this world. He's called us to impart to this world a feeling of, a, of that home. There's a song that's called, says, it feels like home to me. And it's talking about a person. My cousin had it at her wedding. He's basically saying, you feel like home to me. And no matter where I am in this world, I can feel at home because I'm with you. Jesus had several encounters like this in the New Testament. And we're going to talk about that in a, in a minute. But I want to start with Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. And it says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. The building up of the body of Christ. We are the body. We are the messengers of the gospel. We are, as Pastor Petrobe put it Wednesday night, Jesus Jr. to the world. We carry something special inside of us. Given us he's given us the ability to build up the body of Christ, to build up others in, through his love. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, we'll read this one as well. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers. You have found home. Now go be home 
to this world. Jesus gave his disciples the great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, what he meant was share what I have done for you. I, I have brought you into myself, into my heart, into my fold. I have brought you home. Now go bring others home. In order to be the place or to take or to bring others home, we have to be connected, right? In order to be the body of Christ, we've got to be connected to the head, which is Christ. First Corinthians talks about the body of Christ and the working of each part of the body having its place. But if the, those parts of the body are not connected, is it a body at all? No. It says, but I also want you to think about, this is 1 Corinthians 12, 19 through 31. I also want you to think about how this keeps your significance from getting blown up into self-importance. This is the message, by the way. For no matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. An enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be a body, but a monster. What we have is one body with many parts, each its proper size and in its proper place. No part is important on its own. If you run across a liver on the street, does that bear any importance or significance in your life other than like, um, somebody call the cops because why is there a liver laying here on the side of the street, right? But it can't do anything or provide any services to anyone when it's detached from the body. It can't filter anything. That's what it does in your body. It filters, but disconnected from the body, it cannot function. Can you imagine the eye telling the hand, get lost, I don't need you, or a head telling its foot, you're fired. Your job has been phased out. As a matter of fact, in practice, it works the other way. The lower part, the more basic, therefore the more necessary. You can live without an eye, for instance, but not without a stomach. When it's a part of your own body you are concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible, clothed, higher, or lower. You give it dignity and honor just as it is without comparisons. If anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion to full-bodied hair? I don't know, there's some people in here, I don't know. It might, might take a stomach ache <laughs> over losing their hair. The way God designed our bodies is a model for our understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part, the parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every part is involved in the hurt and the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberant, exuberance. You are Christ's body. Amen. That's who you are. You can't escape that. When you said yes to Jesus, that became your identity. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of that body does your part mean anything at all. So in order to be the place or be home to a lost and dying world, you must be connected to the source, which is Christ. We, for years, had a sign language and dance ministry here at the church. And we would, have, we would practice together because if 
we were asked to minister somewhere, minister a song somewhere at a place. If we hadn't practiced, we would be a very distracting bunch of people. No one would want to watch what we do, let alone be blessed by what we were doing. And of course, our heart and goal was to bless and to minister. But there were times where we would have to call one member out because they were doing something that didn't match what the rest of the group was doing, right? It wasn't in sync. It wasn't in unity. And when you have a whole group of people doing the same thing, and then you have one person that's just subtly off, or their hands over here. We used to, if you're not using your hands, sign, signing team members in here, what do you do with it? If you're not using one of your hands, what do you do with it? Put it behind your back because it is wildly distracting to be like, I'm signing the word God, and then my hand is over here on its own planet doing its own thing, right? So we'd sometimes have to call somebody out and be like, hey, like, put that hand behind your back. Or everybody else's head is down. Why is your head up? We are the body of Christ. We are one unit. We are to move as one concerted group. Because when you have a rogue body part that's out there doing something that's not connected to the body of Christ and it's not connected to the source, it is doing nobody any good. And as a matter of fact, it's distracting from the greater purpose and the vision of what God called us to do as a body of Christ. Many people in this day and age, in this culture, have forsaken the body of Christ. They're like, well, because I believe in Christ and I accepted Jesus, I'm part of the body of Christ, boom, it ends there. But if you are never assembling together, if you are never coming together as the body of Christ in a house in a church, in a place, and I don't care if you have church in a tent, and there are all sorts of different types of churches all across the United States and across the globe, we don't all look the same, but it's important that we're coming together. You can come together in the most beautiful edifice, or you can come together in a tent, or you can come together under the stars, or you can come together in a house, but you've got to come together. In order to be the body of Christ, we've got to come together. We've got to be together. We've got to be eye to eye, face to face, heart to heart. No Zoom call here. Right? You ever watch any of these weird shows like, was it like 90 Day Fiance or something like that? Like, I don't know. I don't know. That's got to be God-ordained to work, right? I'm not saying God can't do it. But, but what I'm saying is there's something that happens with face-to-face -face connection and time together. I would venture to guess that those in here who have been married for a year don't quite have as much figured out as those who have been married for 40 years. And it's because you've spent time together. You've been connected. You've been assembled. In order to be the place or be the body of Christ, we must be connected to the source. Ephesians 1, and 23 says, And God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him as head over the body, ahead over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills in all. We carry as his body the fullness of Christ. And if we were to understand what that word fullness means, nothing would be impossible to us. If we could tap in to that, to that fullness, to that word, the fullness of Christ we carry with us. You carry the fullness, the fullness, all of it. Christ who spoke and the world was formed, who breathed the breath of life into man. We carry his 
carry his glory. We carry home with us. But you can't just be connected to the head to carry the fullness. Okay, you come to church, you assemble, okay, you got that right. You're doing that all good. But you have to respond to the head. So if my brain were to send a signal to my foot and my foot doesn't respond, there's a problem, right? And in a physical body, we don't even, I'm walking, but it's not like I'm saying, okay, Lindsay, take a step, take a step, take a step, take a step. My brain is doing it for me. I have the will to walk, it engages my brain, and here we go. When your will is surrendered and submitted to the head, which is Christ, you walk in step with him, and you don't even have to, to tell yourself. When our will is submitted and connected to the head, we respond to his speaking naturally. We respond without question or thought. You hear, give that person $20, and you just walk right over, and you hand that person $20. You hear, give that person a smile. You hear, go help that mama with her baby that's screaming in the grocery store, and you do it. You don't question, you do. Sometimes you may be like, hey, I just feel like going to Walmart today. That's, if you don't have any reason to go to Walmart, that's probably Jesus wanting you to go to Walmart for some reason. When our will is submitted to him, then our desires become his desires, even down to the small, tiny things like going to Walmart. <laughs> Choosing where you get your gas. You know, I think I'll go to Circle K today instead of Shell. Why? I don't know. I just feel like going to Circle K. Well, maybe there's a reason you're supposed to go to Circle K. But we must respond to the head. We can't, it's not good enough just to be connected. It's not good enough just for me to have a brain inside my head. My body's got to be responding to it. My body's got to be submitted to what my brain says to do. We can't be the body if we're not connected to the head, if we're not responding to the head, and if we're not connecting to one another. We've got to have those three elements Matthew 4.4, 4. Jesus was speaking to his disciples. But he answered and said, it is written, man, oh no, he's not speaking to his disciples. Just, he's talking to the devil. That's, excuse me. That's an important detail. <laughs> I do know my Bible stories, okay? Matthew 4.4, 4. but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So Jesus had been led away into the wilderness. The Bible says he was led. He wasn't forced, like he wasn't being punished, but God led him to the wilderness. Just like God led the children of Israel to the wilderness. Jesus was in his wilderness for 40 days, fasting. The children of Israel were in the wilderness, physical desert wilderness for 40 years. See all these types and shadows. The Old Testament is awesome because it's a type and shadow of Christ. Like so much that we read in the Old Testament, it's like, oh, I see Jesus. Boom, Jesus, boom, Jesus. Here he is, Jesus. So here we are again. Jesus was led into the wilderness. He's been fasting for 40 days and the devil confronts him. And he's like, so what's up with this whole fasting thing you're doing, Jesus? Like, can't you turn that rock into a piece of bread? Feed yourself? What do you do? Come on. You are the fullness of the Godhead and bodily form. Turn that stone into a piece of bread and eat. And Jesus is like, mm -mm. get thee behind me, Satan. He's like, no, this is not about satisfying my flesh. He says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Yeah. You are not going to provide me a counterfeit devil, is what he's saying. But that word there, rhema, 
that the word word mean, is the Greek word rhema. It's not logos. So what Jesus is talking about there is the continual fresh word. By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So we have our written Bible, which is the logos word. It's written, it's bound, we're not adding to it, we're not taking away from it, it is infallible, it's the infallible word of God, it's our Bible, it's what we hang our hat on, right? But then this word rhema, the word of God that is rhema, it's the fresh, continual word. What is the fresh, continual word? So sometimes we hear the voice of God, some people get this audible speaking of the Lord to them. Have you ever heard people tell stories like that? where they actually physically hear the voice of the Lord. Sometimes you get that still, small voice inside of you. But God chooses to give his rhema word most often through earthen vessels. The people like me and people like you. The New Testament talks about that we are living epistles known and read of men. God is writing his rhema word in you, in your heart, and giving you the ability to be that fresh bread that this world needs by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He has partnered with us to get that preceding word, that life sustaining word, the one that you can't live without. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You hold life. The word that he's writing in you holds life. You need the living epistles in your life. We are here not to be consumers. We're not here today to be consumers. You're not here just to come and enjoy worship. You're not here just to come and enjoy the word, enjoy the teaching. You are here to serve, to give, to love. You are here to be a living epistle to somebody else. But you are, there is a reciprocity there, right? As you are a living epistle in somebody's life, you need living epistles in your life. You need what God has, is writing and speaking through somebody else in your life. You need that voice. You need that connection. Can we go ahead and share that video? Did you get that video ready? We used to have people bring casseroles to us when we were going through a hard time. Do y'all even know what a casserole is? Like cream of chicken soup and sour cream on anything makes a casserole. And y'all all need to learn about that. That's how we used to live. Like we used to take care of each other, even in my lifetime. And now guess what people call that? They call that an interruption. They call that, I don't want to impose. I don't, I don't want to bother you and y'all because we are not bothering each other and we've set such great boundaries with all our relationships we don't even know what it looks like to love each other anymore knock on a door for the rest of your life know your neighbors because you know what you crave you actually want to be needed it feels good to be needed because need facilitates connection we used to have people bring casseroles to us when we were going through a hard time do y'all even know what a casserole is like cream of chicken soup and sour cream on any. <laughs> <laughs> but she's speaking the truth. We are so afraid of being an inconvenience to somebody that we're not being the body of Christ at all. We have these boundaries, and yes, like I know you have to set boundaries in your life. I have, to, I have had to learn how to say no. But we tippy-toe around one another as though our heart to love and bless 
is going to be taken the wrong way every time. Jesus encounters this woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. Let me find my reference for that. I think it's in Matthew. Jesus kind of has to flee the city that he was speaking in, as he so often had to do because the Pharisees were up to no good, as they usually were. But he goes towards Samaria, now goes, chooses to go through Samaria. Now at that day and time, a Jew would have specifically avoided going through Samaria. They would have like gone hours out of their way to avoid going through Samaria, but not Jesus. Jesus knew he had an appointment. He decided to go to the Circle K instead of the Shell. And he meets this woman at the well and has a, a pretty cool encounter. So not only is he not where typically he sh a Jew should be, but he's also speaking to someone who he should not be speaking to because of their cultural differences. But Jesus felt like home to this lady for the first time, she met the man that could make everything right. She met the one with the answers. She met the one with hope. Jesus and the Samaritan woman had nothing in common, yet he feels like home to her. That had to be so weird for her to encounter this person that was supposed to hate her. And for her to be like, I really like this guy. There's something special about this person, this encounter. And Jesus wasn't just being all sweet and wasn't all pleasantries like, oh, you what a lovely woman. Would you get me some? Jesus didn't have a British accent, I'm sure. <laughs> Would you draw me some water? No, like Jesus gets up in her business. He imposes himself upon her. He doesn't wonder, I wonder if she'll be okay if I give her this word. No. He said, he, the woman said when she went back to her town, he told me everything I had ever done. He got real. He was unexpected. He provided answers. He revealed things about her. He got to the root of her issues. He healed her. And then he commissioned her. Go tell. Go share what you've experienced here. By the power of the Holy Ghost inside of you, you can feel like home. You can be to this world what Jesus was to the woman at the well. Because you carry the same living water inside of you. The same sustaining power lives inside of you. There are several encounters in the New Testament of people when they encounter Jesus. Jesus. The woman at the well, Zacchaeus, he was a hated tax collector. Nicodemus, he was one of the group of people that picked on Jesus the most. He had to visit Jesus at night because it was unacceptable to be seen with Jesus. Mary Magdalene, the woman caught in adultery. Pontius Pilate. The thief on the cross. All of these people, when they came to Jesus, they found the place that their soul had been longing to be. They found rest. They found healing. 
They found a camaraderie that they couldn't understand. Years of cultural oppression was broken off of the woman at the well when she encountered Jesus. She could finally breathe because Jesus took the chains off of her life. Jesus felt like home to those that encountered him. To the broken, he was a place of restoration. To the sick, he was a place of healing. To the lonely, he was a place of companionship. To the complacent, he was discomfort. To the religious, he was unorthodox. Being the place, being Jesus to the world, it may not always be ooey-gooey. You may not always be well-received. In fact, the Bible tells us that we won't always be well-received. But you've got a willing to risk being an imposition. You've got to be willing to risk being a bother or making someone uncomfortable if you're going to be Jesus to the world. Can somebody bring that cork board up here to me? This is what people have experienced here at the river. This is also what people can experience when they meet you in the marketplace. A place of planting and transformation. A place of acceptance. Family. Answered prayers place of miracles, place of revelation, place of peace, a place that's closer to Jesus, a place of restoration, home, freedom from years of abuse. place where God loves me, a place of revival of faith. Do you know how many people are walking around out there that had faith at one time, and the reason they're not walking with the Lord right now is because they've lost their faith? You carry the fire inside of you to rekindle that faith. Know who you are. You are the place where God restores. You are the place of identity. When you're connected to the head, and when you're doing what the head tells you to do, and when you're connected with the body of Christ, and we are whole, and we are unified, this is what we are to the world. This is what feels like home Amen. to our world. Ephesians 4. We are in an Ephesians 4 season, so I want to read this. Starting at verse 4, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation you are called. That word vocation there means the voice within. Walk worthy of of the calling of the voice that he's placed inside of you. With all lowliness and meekness, when you impose yourself on somebody, be meek. All right? With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. 
Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring. Try your best to be unified with the body of Christ. Now, you may not always hit the mark. We're human, right? But just simply endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called, in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. One. Do you, know how, do you see how many times the word one there is spoken? He wants us to understand we are one. One body. There's one spirit. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. But to, uh, unto every one of us is given a grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Some of you might have the casserole grace. That might just be your gifting, is to take casseroles to people. Not my grace. The Lord has me share other things with people. I need cucumber salad. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. That's quite the measure. According to the measure of the gift of Christ. That is pretty much unending, right? Like it never runs out. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Us. He gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We are producers, not consumers. We are here to serve one another. We are here and filled to edify. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. There's that fullness again. That we henceforth be no more children. No more immature. You're responsible for becoming mature. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The enemy's waiting on you to mess up, but that is not worth not serving the Lord over, right? Just because the enemy's waiting on you to, to mess it up and to use your gift the wrong way and to offend somebody. You still love, you still serve, you still give because you're called to do it. And because God has given you a measure of grace to do it, it's worth the risk. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. We're supposed to be kind of this not self-sufficient in the way like you're relying on yourself. But we're supposed to work together so well when we're connected with Christ, we don't need the extras. Right? Every joint supplies. Like what we need is here. It's among us. He's given all the parts. He's made it. Us full because he's given you 
the person to your right and to your left. Does that make sense? Every joint supplies. When you're connected, you have what you need. Your needs are supplied when you're connected. If you're disconnected, you don't, right? This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Put that man away and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Impose yourself on your neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that steal, stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. I may have mentioned this before, but there's a, a guy whose books I read, um, his name's Bob Goff, but he's gotten to the place in his life, he's retirement age, where he doesn't need to work to meet the needs of his family. So when he goes to work, he says that he's fundraising for the kingdom of God. So this right here says... Working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. You've got a job, not simply to feed your family. You've got a job so that you can bless others. And it may be that it's not through finance necessarily. It may be that you have a job because you have an appointment in that place. To give to him that needs. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Man, our tongues are powerful. Amen. And let me tell you, what you don't say has a whole lot of power. Like the not speaking is as powerful as the speaking sometimes. When you carry the word of God inside of you and you're not speaking it, that's as detrimental as speaking negative. Right? You've got something to say. Don't squelch that. Don't hold it down. Speak. Take the risk and speak the word of God. Risk being an imposition with your words that God has given you to speak. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another. Be nice. Don't be flipping people off in traffic. Be nice. Do you know how frustrating it is? I know you do because you're human and you live in this world. But to be treated like awful at the drive through window or whatever, <laughs> we were in Florida. No, I keep saying we were in Florida. We were in South Carolina on vacation. And we're at this drive through window. It's a Bojangles. Have any of y'all ever eaten a Bojangles? Bowberry biscuits, right? It's a little blueberry biscuit topped with some icing drizzle. It's like... The southern equivalent of a cinnamon roll. It's good. So anyway, we're at Bojangles, and we're pulling through the drive-thru, and I'm in the back seat, so I'm witness to everything that my father has said to the person at the speaker, and he orders a Diet Coke. 
and we get up to the window and they hand my dad something yellow and he's like oh he's like um he's like i don't think this is my order i ordered a diet coke he goes no uh you ordered a diet mountain dew <laughs> dad's like oh i did like I don't even think I've ever drank a Diet Mountain Dew, like, let alone ever ordered one. But Dad was nice to him anyway. It would have been really a lot more fun to be like, you little twit. You don't know what I ordered because you apparently weren't listening to what I ordered. But he didn't. He's a nice boy. But be kind to people, even when they're not kind to you. Be kind. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Forgive, forgive, and then forgive some more. You're going to get hurt. I'm just going to work, give you, okay, just you're going to get hurt. You're going to church with other human beings. You're in this world existing with other human beings. You're going to get hurt. Get used to forgiving. Get good at it. Amen. Forgive. And don't just pretend to forgive and say, I forgive you, and then hold on to it like it's your sugar stick, right? Forgive and let it go. Unity of the body, united in purpose. All these things on this board, God did for you guys through the power of his love. And he has placed his love inside of you. So this is possible, and this can be possible, for everybody else out there, every other person on this planet, if they know you. If they know what he's done for you. Tell people what he's done for you. Take somebody a coffee and say, hey, I want to tell you what God has done for me. Drink this coffee and listen. <laughs> right? If I could have the worship team come on up. And the baptism folks can go ahead and get ready. The book of Ephesians is written about the church at Ephesus. And this church was very uniquely positioned within the culture, within its locale, for the work that God had intended to do there, for what Paul took there and what God taught through Paul to the church at Ephesus. It was a place that a lot of people could get to and where a lot of people came. There was a specific temple there that drew a lot of people in. It was a, not, a, not a Jesus temple. It was a Greek goddess temple. A little different. But it had a drawing card, and Paul saw the unique position of the church at Ephesus because it could be an epicenter where, you know, like you watch the drop go in the water, and then it just ripples. That was Ephesus. They were the center point of the drop. The church at Ephesus was the first church referenced in Revelation 2 when Jesus is speaking to the seven churches. And he commends them for much. You do all these things well. They were a people of fortitude. They did not compromise on their faith or their doctrine, no matter what else was being spoken. They were good. At Christianity they had it down 
They loved one another. They did all these things. But because they got good at it, they left their first love. They left the passion that they had at one time, the motivating driver. We can't lose that. We've got to always remember what God did for us in the place. Keep that fresh in your mind because that's what keeps the fire alive inside of you. That's what keeps the passion for Christ burning inside of you is remembering where God brought you from. Testify and tell your story because it keeps it fresh. Share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tell them how Christ bled for them because it keeps it fresh in your mind and in your heart. Do not leave your first love. Do not forsake it. Do not forget how at one time you used to couldn't wait to get to the house of the Lord. If you find yourself dragging your feet to the church house every Sunday morning, Ask God to take you back to the place of your first love. Ask him to connect you once again and give you that first time feeling of when he came into your life and he transformed you. Ask him to help you remember how awful it felt before you found him. Before you encountered his goodness. Some of us don't even remember what it was like. Ask him to help you remember what it was like before he came into your life. Ask him to help you remember what it felt like to be that angry person, that broken person. Because you've got to remember that in order to stay fresh and to stay with your testimony on your tongue. Don't forget don't forsake the place of your first love because you have the power to feel like home. You have the power to impart hope. Be the place. Be home to somebody this week. Make a point this week to go through and read these in all the encounters that people had with Jesus. Some of these, the ones I read off of the woman at the well, Zacchaeus, Nicodemus, Mary Magdalene, the woman caught in adultery, Pontius Pilate, the thief on the cross. Read through those, revisit those moments where people encountered Jesus for the first time. And then think about the moment you encountered Jesus for the first time. And then think about all of the moments that you're getting ready to have with others. Because revival is here. People are ready to encounter you. They're hungry. They're waiting. It's here. The moment has come. People are ready for you. They're ready for you to impose. They're ready for you to show them Jesus. Would you stand with me? Be the place. Go back in your heart and reconnect with the head if you need to. If you've been disobedient and God has been calling you to do something and you've not been doing it, repent and make it right. In the book of Revelation, God gives the church at Ephesus the opportunity to repent and reconnect to their first love. If that's you, do it. Because God promised in that same chapter to disconnect himself if they didn't. You don't want to be disconnected truly when God disconnects you, right? We don't want to be found in that place. 
So be connected to the head. Respond to the head. And then if you've not been connecting, if you've been avoiding people, if you've been going through something and you've put up the walls, repent, tear down those walls, connect. And if you've been walking this walk of faith in hiding out in the world, in the public sector, hide no more. Share that feeling of home with the people around you. Be vulnerable. It's okay. Chances are they need your vulnerability. They need something that's real. They need someone that's real. Someone that's willing to say, this is what happened. This is what was done to me. This is why I was the way I was before Jesus found me. They need real. They need Christians that are not just putting up a front like life is perfect. Because life is not perfect. It never will be until Christ returns and establishes his kingdom. Be real. It's okay. It's okay to lose your temper in front of a lost person because you know what? You now have the opportunity to repent to them and to make them right and show them that Christians are real. Christians struggle with the same things everybody else struggled with. Don't deny those opportunities of vulnerability. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to love Jesus and be connected and be surrendered to the head and walk in time with him. Is it Ariel or Ariel? Ariel. Ariel's decided to connect to the head. Rachel's been out there being Jesus. Does Rachel feel like home to you when you met her? Something different about her, huh? This is what happens. Naturally, it just happens. Salvation happens when we love and we serve and we give and we share. We're excited for you, Ariel. God is going to do awesome things in your life. You can just expect big things. Ariel, have you given your life to Christ? You've made him Lord overall, confessed your sins and asked for forgiveness. Well then, in the name of Jesus Christ, we baptize you for the remission of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost.
blessed to have the whole family here. Thank you guys for coming. Jax is six, and he found Jesus through his mommy and daddy. They're his evangelists, right? I'm telling you, parents, lead your children to Christ. Just such a special thing. Jax, have you given your life to Jesus? And you want him in your heart? Yeah. He's going to walk with you forever. You know that, right? He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And he's given you lots of good things in your heart that you can give to other people. You've got lots of love to give. You've got gifts and callings on your life. And so we just declare those things over you. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we baptize you for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, buddy.